Build a Beautiful Mobile App with Web Technology, was presented as part of the Flash in the City Conference. This presentation was originally recorded on June 12, 2011, in New York City. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, I just got in on the red eye, so bear with me if I'm not quite cohesive. But the caffeine's going to kick in shortly, so we should be good. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for the introduction. My name's James Pierce. I do developer relations for Accenture, so um, talking to people like you about what we do. Uh, I'm from the UK originally, but don't let that deceive you. Accenture is based uh, just south of San Francisco in Silicon Valley. And uh, what I'd like to talk to you this morning about is our views on HTML5 and uh, you know, the, the rise, the dawn, if you like, of rich mobile web applications. So, I mean, this title I thought had uh, rather a lot of adjectives in it, and I thought it might be a, a reasonable idea to try and rewrite it uh, or retitle it uh, using JavaScript. Why not? So, this is basically our agenda for this morning. And uh, I don't know how many of you are JavaScript developers, but uh, basically we're going to evaluate this expression starting from the inside, working our way out. Um, we're going to start off by looking at mobile and just try to get a sense of the state of mobile as it currently stands. So mobile is obviously very exciting right now. Everybody knows they need to be in it, and everybody knows they need to be trying to understand it and do something with it. And uh, that probably started a couple of years ago, right, when the, the iPhone first emerged and got people excited about what the possibilities of, of mobile web, certainly, and mobile as a whole could be. But the companies up and down the country and around the world are all trying to figure out what it meant. And typically, you know, in boardrooms up and down the country, this was the kind of strategy that came out, right? We must have an iPhone app. We don't know what that means, but we've got to have one. And uh, that served well for a little while, okay? Lots of companies put apps uh, out into the app store. Some of them were uh, good, some of them were bad, many of them were bad. But, uh, you know, that, that was the kind of the, the state, state of play. A year later, that changed with the rise of Android. Suddenly, people dashed to the other side of the ship. We must have an Android app. Again, we don't really know what that means, but we must have an app, uh, and we must have a, a native Android app. 2010. Oh, 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 now we need an iPad app. And as you can start to see, there's a bit of a pattern here, right? The, 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 the um, bandwagon of getting apps for each new platform. Uh, when you're building with native technologies can be a real challenge. So you get to 2010, and you look at what's out there. You look at the handsets and the platforms that are out there. Unfortunately, this is the typical <laughs> kind of strategy that we, we, we see people or trying to understand or get their heads around in mobile. It is a huge challenge, particularly with native development. And really, that challenge is, is because of the diversity of platforms. And I'm not here to talk about who's winning and who's losing in the platform wars, but definitely, if you look at the market shares of uh, smartphones, and these are figures from uh, the end of March, so relatively recent, you can see, obviously, Android has got a big market share, and uh, RIM and Apple, I'm sure you've seen charts like this, plenty before. <clears throat> but the point is that there's no one winner. There's no obvious, two obvious winners. There are, there's kind of three platforms at least that you should be considering very seriously. And uh, the challenge, of course, is that each one of those, from a native point of view, uses very different technologies. If you want to build a native Android app, you have to use Java or C++. If you want to build a native app for RIM, you have to use J2ME or, or, or Air. Um, and if you want to do an Apple native app, obviously Objective-C, let alone Microsoft and Palm and so forth. So purely at a technical level, a development team really has to struggle to learn you know, a, a, a good selection of languages just to be able to reach 75% of the, the target users. In Europe, of course, it's uh, a little different. There's a company called Nokia. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of them. I'm not sure I have. Uh, but uh, there's more dominance of one particular platform, but even that is, is not homogenous in terms of technologies. Uh, Nokia handsets tend to run native apps based on C or Python and various other wacky things. So, you know, regardless of where in the world you're targeting and regardless of the, the types of apps you're building, you know, that native challenge is, is a real headache. Uh, to illustrate the point, uh, I'm sure you're most aware of uh, 
the Angry Birds game, uh, very successful on, on iPhone, iPad, Android. Uh, good news is they've ported it to BlackBerry, which kind of goes a little way to illustrating some of the challenges of developing for BlackBerry. It's a little unfair, actually, because the newer versions of BlackBerry now support uh, quite, quite, quite a decent platform, actually, the BlackBerry uh, 6 and uh, Playbook platform. But, you know, it's not, just, it's not just the languages, it's also the form factors, it's also the user experience that, that, that users of given platforms are, are, are used to. So that's the kind of turmoil that's going on in the native world of mobile right now. The question is, is the web an opportunity to try and harmonize this and try and make things a little easier for ourselves and make things a little more consistent and familiar for our users. So the mobile web, to me, looks like a good candidate for, for, for solving a lot of these issues, or at least tackling them. Um, it's cross-platform by default. Uh, it uses, obviously, skills and tools that we've built up over the last 15 years. Um, you know, it's decentralized. There's no such thing as a web app store. Well, there are web app stores, but you don't have to be in a web app store to get out on the web. You can just FTP stuff or however you want to deploy it. And you don't have to ask anyone for permission to do it. Um, you can update your site every hour if you want. You don't have to go through a long process of resubmitting updates to an app store. You don't need to ask Steve Jobs for permission to FTP up new content to your website. Um, it's also indexed in the sense that you've got crawlers, um, you know, search engines that can crawl your content, of course. Um, and as I said, you know, it's, it's well understood. So the question is, does the, the web give us some of the opportunities we need in mobile um, to, you know, overcome these native challenges? At the same time, the web itself is evolving, and I, and I you know, I could talk a lot about this, but, uh, you know, I feel that the web is really undergoing a kind of shift right now. Until recently, it's, it's been a web of documents. Everybody thinks of the web as being pages of information that are linked together. But really, the web is evolving to be one more based around applications, which have functionality, which you know, users want to perform acts with, um, less a sort of a read-only medium and more of a kind of an interactive medium. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's a web where we used to declare HTML to create content, and, and quite often now, we'll be programmatically creating functionality with, let's say, JavaScript. Along those lines, the web is moving from being one where there's a thin client, that is the browser, which turns angle brackets into pixels, into potentially a thicker client, a thicker runtime that's able to execute code uh, and is able to be an, almost an autonomous uh, app itself on the client side without so much uh, effort required from the server. And then in terms of the access itself, we're moving from a web where users have a PC, maybe they have one at home, maybe they have one at work. We're moving to a web where users have multiple devices. You know, and how do we build sites and services and applications that cater for users who have different devices but expect to be able to get to the same kinds of services? And finally, those services are being accessed by people in different contexts. They're not always sat down at a desk anymore. They're out and about. They're, you know the cliches of being on a bus or uh, in the car or walking down the street. They're cliches, but they're true. That's what people do do when they're accessing the web via their mobile or their tablet devices. So the web is evolving in lots of different ways, and you know, those are just a few examples. And it's, it's hard to describe this shift. What, what, what is the name for this shift that's happening? And you know, I can't think of a great, a great uh, single term for that other than HTML5. So HTML5 means a lot of things to a lot of people. Uh, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But you know, to me, it, it, it's a badge, it's a totem that represents this shift that the web is going through right now, uh, all those different things that I've just talked about. Purists will say that HTML5 is, is just the markup language, and that's really you know, what the standards uh, are all about. And that's true to a certain extent. But it's also been associated with lots of other technologies and lots of other standards that are happening. And it's come to mean this big, bro broad marketing umbrella of, of cool stuff you can do with the web now. Um, so I prefer to use it in the, in the biggest sense possible, meaning it's just this, this shift that's happening right now. And, uh, well, since I'm wearing the T-shirt, I can make it mean whatever I want. Okay, so... The question is, how can we actually use the potential of HTML5 and use the way in which the web is shifting to bring uh, a rich uh, web-based experience to mobile users using HTML5, uh, CSS3, and uh, JavaScript. Now, for those of you that uh, 
can parse JavaScript. You'll notice that these uh, three things in the middle here are, are variables, and in, it's true they are very variable, and they're, they're still being standardized, and the boundaries of what can be done and can't be done on different browsers does obviously vary. Um, but let me just talk a little bit about what some of these things actually, uh, actually are. So HTML5, as, as a marketing term, has come to represent uh, a number of things, and the W3C, uh, who are not traditionally very good at marketing, have actually done quite a good job of, of articulating what these uh, various aspects of HTML5 are. And these are the first four. <clears throat> so in the top left-hand side there, we have HTML5 semantics, which is <clears throat> really actually about the markup language itself. So in a, an HTML5 document, you can have headers explicitly declared with tags and footers and sidebars and things. Um, <clears throat> which previously we had to do with throwing in CSS classes and various other hacks and divs all over the place. You can actually now structure your documents in a much more semantic way. Very exciting if you're into semantic documents. To me, that's the least exciting part about HTML5. Frankly, browsers couldn't care less whether your tag was foo or bar. It all gets handled in basically the same way. Um, but uh, I guess search engines like it, so you know, it's up there. Top uh, right, however, is, is far more exciting. Now, unfortunately, uh, that's white text on a white cloudy background, but it says offline and storage. And uh, this is a whole suite of uh, APIs and technologies that are exposed uh, through JavaScript, in fact, <clears throat> whereby the browser makes storage capacity available to a web app, uh, typically up to five megabytes, uh, although the spec is kind of vague, that's more of a recommendation than a hard rule. And uh, some people have described these as kind of cookies on steroids. It's not, it's more complicated than that, but essentially your web app has the opportunity to store large amounts of data uh, on the browser, either keyed off the session that the user is in, or that will persist for a longer time. Um, so that's, that's great, but if you think about that, that, that is a huge step forward, because our, our, our apps, uh, our sites that we've built in the past have all been stateless. Okay, browsers are stateless, and we use, we use cookies to kind of fake state, but now we, we don't have to fake it. We can store significant amounts of, of state on the client side, which allow our browsers to you know, pick up relatively complex state um, at any given point you know, without having to call back to the server, which means potentially we can take our apps offline and continue to work with them, continue to operate against this local data storage, um, and, and, you know, that's obviously very exciting, particularly in mobile, where you can't always guarantee that the user is connected at any given time. Bottom left is another extremely exciting area, which is device access. And there are a suite of standards and specifications around letting the browser expose APIs to the underlying operating system of a, a, of a device or a, a PC. And uh, so it's typically things like geolocation, can the browser tell me where it is? Uh, it's also things like getting access to the camera and the gallery and the messaging capabilities of the, let's say, device that the, the browser is on. All sorts of things that perhaps native developers take for, for granted, but which web developers typically haven't had any access to. Um, I, I guess if you've been using Flash, you can get access to the camera, but you know, from a pure web point of view, you've never been able to do that before. <clears throat> The sad thing about the device access corner of this matrix is that it's poorly implemented right now, uh, particularly in mobile. Uh, and you know, a conspiracy theorist might note that uh, the, the, the vendors of the two main browsers in the mobile space might possibly be trying to defend their uh, native app stores uh, by not putting too much device access stuff into their browsers. Um, but certainly, you know, we expect to see more and more browsers adding these kind of APIs, and I think as a result, we'll see web apps that start to become richer and, 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 and which interact more with the device that they're running on, which will make them much more interesting and exciting. Connectivity, that's not actually a very exciting one. Uh, it allows you to run WebSocket sessions and various other things. Um, and then the, f the other four sections of HTML5 are multimedia, which is the ability to run audio and video. I'm sure you've all seen those kinds of things. Um, then there are a s section of technologies around Canvas and WebGL and being able to do, you know, kind of SVG, data graphics, and so forth. 
uh, which is pretty exciting. And some of that has come to mobile too, which is, which is good. We'll talk about the various support for these things shortly. Uh, then we have performance and integration, which is uh, web workers and the ability to spawn off parallel threads, and obviously CSS for styling. Uh, purists get very upset that CSS gets lumped in with HTML5, but actually a lot of the cool stuff you see in terms of user experience, things that people are doing with apps right now, the looks, the feels, and all the other stuff, uh, a lot of that is being driven by, by CSS3 and the ability to do animations and transitions and so forth. So anyway, that's how the W3C looks at this, but you know, let, let's, let's draw out these different components in another way. If we draw our, our stack of, uh, let's start with you know, HTML, JavaScript, CSS at the core here. Uh, down at the bottom we have, as I was saying, device access to uh, the, the, the file systems, the ability to do parallel processing. Uh, we have uh, the cosmetic level, we can do fonts with CSS3, we can do video and audio, we can do graphics like Canvas and, uh, and WebGL. Then the device access APIs get us access to cameras, contacts, SMS on mobile devices, like geolocation and so forth. Uh, and then obviously it's a web browser, so we have server uh, connectivity back over HTTP, AJAX and so forth. So this is, you know, the same kind of stuff, right? We're just drawing it out in a different way. The point is that when you draw it like this, it looks indistinguishable from the kind of diagram you'll see if you open up any native platform uh, and try to understand its framework. You know, if you were to do an Android 101 course, on, you know, the first day you'll open up the guide and it'll show you the blocks of the Android operating system and you'll see these kinds of things. So this is now no longer about little bits of HTML and little bits of CSS and we can make documents look pretty. It's about basically all of this stuff coming together to create a complete runtime, a complete modern application platform that can now run in the browser. Now some of you that have worked with Flash and other uh, Adobe technologies might have thought that this had already happened, but actually you know, this is happening in a sort of a standards-based way uh, and it's now extremely exciting because it's happening across platform and we're beholden to no one, in theory. So, you know, those are the technology pieces of the jigsaw. How can we actually pull these together to build applications? It's all very well having lots of lovely specifications and uh, browsers that support them, but what can we actually do with it? Um, best way for me to show this, I think, is to actually give you an example. And uh, this is an example that was... Uh, uh, released recently, actually released into an app store, but it's also available on the web. Um, I can't see it moving, so I'm just going to step out here. So this is an application called uh, Travelmate, and it's basically a translator for text from any one language to another. Uh, and uh, you pick the target and source language, and you can tab between uh, those. And then there's a currency converter where you can pick different currencies and convert... Uh, from one to another. And you can see we've got, you know, modal pop-ups, we've got the ability to save data to the local data store so that it works even when it's offline. Uh, these are previously saved conversions because obviously when you're traveling, sometimes you don't always have a data connection in your country you're going to. And we've got fixed toolbars at the top and the bottom. We've got these nice transitions. The point is that that looks like a native app and most users wouldn't know it isn't, but that was built entirely with HTML5 JavaScript and CSS. Uh, this is another example. Uh, this is a UK restaurant company, food company called Irresistible, where you basically pull up a restaurant, order a takeout, order the dishes you want. So again, we've got you know native-looking lists, nice-looking controls. Uh, it's themed up in a sort of a, a brand consistent way. There's a form here. You can see. HTML5 allows you to specify that the, the, the keyboard comes up that's relevant to the, the data that's being entered, so an email gets an at sound, sign. And a little animation at the end there, which you know, you'll be amazed to hear is, is just CSS. Uh, it looks like Flash, but running on an iPhone, that's not going to work. That was all just CSS3. Uh, and the final example is uh, Vimeo. Vimeo is a well-known video service, obviously, online. Uh, had a film festival recently, and they also built a web app for their festival with details about films, directors, and so forth. And again, you've got that nice native-looking scrolling. You've got, uh, you know, obviously their own theming here. They've gone for a very, you know, dark, moody style. 
uh, as well as maps and so forth to be able to identify where the cinemas are. And again, all written purely with HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript. So, you know, that, that's kind of like hopefully the light bulb moment for you. Wow, I didn't realize you could actually build apps that look so smooth and so native uh, with just these, these web based technologies. There's no plugins going on there, nothing magical. That's all just core standard stuff happening in a browser. Well, you know, the challenge, of course, or one of the problems that we're setting out to try and solve here is that of, of making it run across platform. You know, that's all very well if I can make it look great on a modern iPhone, but, you know, what is the real cross-platform support for some of this stuff? And uh, the good news is that actually in mobile in particular, there is some degree of browser homogeneity that we, we, we don't see on the desktop web. And that's really because the, the major vendors in the mobile space, i.e. Apple, BlackBerry, Android, and uh, HP Palm, <coughs> as well as Nokia, actually, uh, have based their browsers on WebKit, which is a, a web rendering engine that came out of uh, Conqueror and which was open sourced by Apple <coughs> to create Safari. And uh, whilst that doesn't guarantee that all these browsers are the same, it does guarantee that at least from a rendering point of view, they have uh, some degree of consistency. And most of these vendors tend to, to, to interact with the, the trunk of the WebKit open source project fairly regularly. So, you know, common progression that happens in one tends to get shared between them. Um, on the other hand, we have the usual suspects, Internet Explorer, Opera, and Firefox, uh, who I've named the foes simply because of the first letters of their names, no other reason. Um, and uh, those are interesting, obviously, but they're not necessarily a prevalent force in mobile right now. Um, <clears throat> Firefox does have a mobile browser, but it doesn't come bundled with any handset. You have to install it. Uh, Opera is, yeah, you know, Opera Mini is, is obviously extremely popular in the developing world. Uh, Opera Mobile doesn't seem to have a huge amount of traction, although it's pretty good. Uh, Internet Explorer is definitely one to watch with the rise of Windows Phone 7, of course. Um, Windows Phone 7 shipped with IE 7 and a half, kind of a derivative of that, um, which was pretty poor at supporting most contemporary HTML5 things. Uh, but uh, Microsoft has committed to bring IE 9 in a mobile format to uh, Windows Phone 7 in the Mango update, which is, well, imminent. So. We're actually looking forward to, to seeing pretty good HTML5 support from uh, Internet Explorer on the Windows Phone 7 platform. And IE10, I actually expect to be one of the best HTML5 browsers out there when we see it. So uh, this is a chart which, oh, questions? Yes, go ahead. So uh, this is just for the mobile space. So. So it's a bit confusing. Google is a bit schizophrenic here because they have two browser teams, basically Chrome and then Android. And they share very little between them. I mean, it's not the same team. So the browser that you get on Android, both on the, Chrome, on the devices, mobile devices and on the tablets, is nothing to do with Chrome. It's Chromium, which is the name of the open source project that they share. Um, but actually, two completely separate teams. And well, you know, I don't want to talk too much about Google internal politics, but it's not entirely clear uh, how these two sh interact uh, effectively. And the tablet browser for Android is just dreadful, really terrible, relative to Chrome on, on, on the Mac or on the PC. So um, we, we, we all hope that the Chrome team prevails and manages to get their stuff onto Android because the, the world will be a much better place. The, the, Chrome, uh, sorry, the Android browser lacks all sorts of hardware acceleration, which is the main thing. Um, you know, the, the, the responsiveness is, is generally pretty poor. Um, we did a review of the Motorola Zoom uh, a couple of months ago uh, where we were specifically reviewing the browser and it was tragic, unfortunately. So, sorry. <laughs> what I've got here is a chart which shows uh, some of the aspects of HTML5 down the left-hand side and across the top, hopefully you can see it there, uh, some of the edge browsers that are out there. So IE 10, Chrome 10, Safari 5, and Firefox 4 on the desktop. And on the right-hand side, iOS, Playbook, and Honeycomb. Uh, this is iOS 4.3. We've since had a look at uh, iOS 5.0. Um, I'll come to that in a moment. 
So uh, the good news here, you might be surprised to see just how much green there is. Green means that these are supported. Um, and you know, people who say, oh, HTML5 isn't ready, uh, even on the desktop, that's not true, but certainly not in mobile. Um, there's more green <laughs> in, on the mobile smartphone browsers than there are, uh, is on desktop browsers. Inline, inline SVG. Yeah, regular SVG works. iOS 5 added inline SVG. We haven't updated this chart. We're not allowed to because we're under NDA, but I can tell you it does support inline SVG. Um, so the two, two takeaways here. Firstly, HTML5 as a whole is, you know, becoming a reality. No one needs to build an app that uses every single thing here. So, you know, if you're, if you're only using a selection of these capabilities, you're probably going to be fine. The other takeaway is that mobile is by far, uh, well, not by far, but, you know, r r relatively uh, even better at, at uh, providing support. There are a couple of notable uh, weaknesses. Um, you can't run WebGL on any of these mobile browsers. So if you're looking to write a high frame rate three-dimensional game. Um, you can't currently do that, but uh, I believe Firefox Fennec does support WebGL, so uh, it's definitely starting to come, and I think iOS 5 will also support WebGL, fingers crossed. Um, and obviously, this is a fast-moving um, space, right? These browsers are coming out remarkably quickly, and the standards are maturing relatively quickly, too. So the question is, how do I stay on top of all of this diversity? Uh, I just wanted to point you towards two or three sites here which are pretty useful, I think, if you're trying to develop against this, this set of moving targets. One is caniuse.com, which is a fantastic kind of browser matrix with uh, various HTML5 capabilities and which browser versions support it. It's kind of like a research tool. Uh, you'd use it at design time, I think, to figure out which of your, your dream technologies are going to be working on your target uh, browsers. Second one you, you may well have heard of is Modernizer. Modernizer is a runtime uh, library. It actually gets get sent to the client at the top of your app and which <clears throat> does feature detection within the browser. It basically tries various APIs, sees which ones work and which ones don't. So at runtime on the client side, you could make decisions about which uh, various capabilities you wanted to use and how you wanted to fall back to those that didn't. And then the third one, which uh, is, is very mobile specific, is one called Device Atlas. And this is a device capabilities database that you host on your server and which uses user agent uh, recognition coming from the, the browser to basically allow you to do lookups of, uh, let's say, video codec support or image format support and so forth for, for different mobile devices. There are pros and cons to each one of these techniques. Uh, and some of them will depend upon how you want to, uh, you know, what, what the architecture of your web app is and, uh, you know, what kind of capabilities you're looking for. But the point is, you know, whether it's at design time or it's at runtime on the client or runtime on the server, there are various resources out there for you to be able to navigate the diversity between browsers. Um, the other alternative for trying to smooth the path to making this stuff work is to use a uh, framework, a development framework. And in the JavaScript space in particular, this is where most of the kind of uh, innovation is happening. And there are a bunch of JavaScript frameworks out there that you can use on the client side to help build these rich apps. Obviously, Accenture, that's uh, Accenture Touch. Um, but there's also JQ Touch, Sprout Core, jQuery, I'm sure you've all heard of. There's a jQuery mobile framework. And a bunch of other open source ones, such as XUI, Joe, Zepto, and so forth. A lot of these, uh, well, some of these d serve different purposes to others. Obviously, XUI and IUI tend to be around just making it look pretty. Um, and then Censure, Sprout Core are m more for building richer, self-contained MVC apps that run on the client side. Um, jQuery and JQ Touch provide a sort of a progressive enhancement uh, uh, approach for uh, turning documents into applications on the client side. And which you choose obviously depends a little on the sort of app you're building, depends a little bit on your mindset, just depends a little bit on your skill set. So, you know, if you're happy working with documents and you're happy working with HTML and you still view the web as being one where there's like a thin client uh, and a lot of your logic is on the server side, then you'll probably look at something like JQ Touch or jQuery Mobile. 
If you're looking to build an app which is more self-contained and it's uh, richer and it has its own data storage and its own logic and its own user interface on the, on the client side, then you're probably looking at something like Central Touch or Sprout Core. And obviously, if you're looking to deploy an app into an app store where there isn't necessarily a web server involved at all, right? It's just being distributed to the device as a client-only unit, um, then the latter frameworks tend to be more uh, effective. Let's just take a look at what some of those differences are. This might help you to understand the differences I'm trying to spell out here. Um, <clears throat> so JQ Touch is uh, it's actually a, a, a small framework that sits on top of jQuery. And it uses declarative HTML, and, and the library will progressively enhance your document to create an app-like experience. I'm just checking, because it's quite a dark theme. It doesn't always show well on present, uh, projectors. But you can see the kind of thing that you get produced, nice fixed toolbars, nice lists, and the disclosure buttons, and so forth. Works on uh, most WebKit-based browsers. And the code would typically look like this. Yeah, it's just about big enough. Hopefully, you can see that. Um, so you have a document here, classic HTML document. Uh, in the head, you're basically linking to jQuery, and you're linking to JQ Touch. Uh, and then you're instantiating it, but then the body of the document itself is where you have stored your data, um, the, the, the structure of the app. In this case, it's a list of continents, so we have uh, a div for the toolbar at the top, and then we have uh, a, a list at the bottom there with North America, South America, Europe, and so forth. And what you can see there is that it's using the class attribute, in other words, using CSS names, to sort of hint to the framework how it wants it to, to appear. So div class equals toolbar gets slammed to the top uh, with the nice graded fill, and uh, ul class equals rounded gets turned into that nice list data list in the middle there with the rounded corners. So there are various clues that you can give. But in theory, this is progressive enhancement. So if the JavaScript doesn't fire for some reason, uh, then you've still got a relatively um, semantic document there. And people who are familiar with HTML, they love this approach, right? Because they can just continue to write angle brackets and lash a bit of JavaScript on at the top, and magic happens. Uh, jQuery Mobile is a little similar. Uh, it's, it's still in alpha. I, th I think they were due to do a beta recently. They haven't, they haven't quite done it. Um, has a very similar kind of device uh, target, although I believe they're also trying to target earlier versions of BlackBerry than many of the other frameworks, so good luck with that. Um, and uh, jQuery Mobile, again, uses a document progressive enhancement approach. <clears throat> but rather than using CSS classes, they use uh, an attribute called data role. One of the things that HTML5 allows you to do is have data hyphen anything as a valid attribute. And so the jQuery mobile team have, have come up with a, a small sort of um, taxonomy, if you like, of, of attributes that you can use to describe, again, how you want the document to appear in an app-like way. So data role equals header, slams it to the top. Data role equals content. Data role equals list view, and so forth. And when you link to these things, it pulls in more content over AJAX and slides it across and kind of fools the user into thinking they're, they're in an app. Central Touch, on the other hand, as I said, is, is more of a self-contained library, and we're not relying on a document coming from a server to pretty up. We're actually trying to create the whole application on the client side, and we're, um, again, generally supporting WebKit-based browsers, which is iOS, Android, BlackBerry, um, and Windows Phone 7, although not WebKit, uh, we will uh, we'll be supporting once they support IE9. Um, but Central Touch is a very uh, kind of a different approach. Um, in that, well, if you look at the bottom, hopefully you can see the, the text there. <clears throat> the HTML has open body, closed body. There is, there is no body to the document. The index.html is essentially just uh, a bootstrap that you send out to the device so that JavaScript can run. Uh, and the entire application and its business logic and its data modeling and the user interface that gets constructed is done in JavaScript. So hopefully you can read that, but you, know, you can see that we instantiate a new application, and when we launch it, we register the continent model, we put some data into the continent data store, and then we create a panel with a list, and we bind that list to the data store. Now you might say, well, that seems like a lot of effort when previously we were just emitting you know, a UL, L-I-L-I-L-I. -L -I -L -I. Well, yes, uh, 
but this is far more of a sort of a classic application development approach. If you've been doing native development on the client side, or you've been doing server side MVC kind of development with Rails or you know Django or whatever, this is the sort of thing that you're used to doing. <clears throat> you know, creating models, creating views creating controllers and templates and so forth to bind it all together. And it does make it a lot easier to build scalable enterprise-grade applications that run just on the client side. So that may not be what you're trying to do, in which case this may not be the right tool. But if you are, then uh, you know, Central Touch is definitely a, a, a strong option. So you know, I talk about progressive enhancement, and, and you know, it is a, uh, uh, it's treated as a standard, uh, this concept of having a document that stands alone, uh, but which can be made more in interactive and, 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 and faked into an application. Um, it's not always the right way to go. If you need to build a first-class application, build a first-class application. Don't start with a document and try to turn it into a paper airplane. If someone tells you you need an airplane and all you've got is a piece of paper, then, of course, you can make a paper airplane. But it's not going to get you across the Atlantic. <clears throat> so what do we find in a lot of these frameworks? Um, just quickly running through the kind of uh, characteristics that you'll typically find. Um, of course, by the way, you can build apps with HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript without having to use any third-party code at all. You can build the whole thing yourself. But generally, the idea of a framework is it's going to give you a lot of the common elements that you need to get started quickly, um, which, you know, at the cosmetic level is going to include the widgets and the, the, the components, such as the nested lists, the toolbars, the buttons, uh, the nice, you know, um, form fields and sliders and so forth. Which, you know, if you want to make an app that users feel familiar with the kind of user interface patterns, then, uh, you know, that, that gives you a quick head start. Um, because these are all running in browsers, uh, it's sometimes easy to forget. Because it's all running in a browser, you know, these things are generally easy to theme and adapt and make look specific to your, to your own brand or what have you uh, using CSS. Uh, in the case of Central Touch, actually, we use a technology called SAS. And if you come along to the workshop at lunchtime, I'll, uh, I'll be giving a demo of SAS, hopefully, um, which is a, a sort of a layer above CSS3. It makes it really easy to kind of uh, create nice, modular, well-structured CSS. Um, but, you know, a little bit of CSS can go a long way to give your app a unique uh, feel and, uh, and kind of brand. A lot of the frameworks will come with iconography as well, so you can have those kind of standard icons on toolbars and so forth. Um, forms, f styling forms on the web has always been a nightmare. Uh, on mobile devices, uh, it's a little bit more tricky because you haven't necessarily got you know, a hardware keyboard and you want to make input as easy as possible. So you'll find that uh, frameworks, uh, certainly Center Touch, but others as well, will provide widgets and styling to make your forms look nice with the date pickers and so forth. As it happens, I think iOS 6, sorry, iOS 5 uh, on the iPhone will support uh, native date pickers in the browser, uh, but obviously you'll need to provide similar fallbacks for, for legacy browsers. Scrolling. It feels strange having a whole slide about scrolling, but <clears throat> a lot of people put a lot of effort into making the scrolling feel right, um, because users, for some reason, take that as a cue that this app is a nice, smooth kind of native experience. And uh, that's a little tricky in the browser as it happens because browsers, uh, web, mobile web browsers, uh, don't support overflow scroll very well and they don't support f uh, position fixed in CSS very well. So uh, a lot of uh, effort goes into making this feel nice and smooth and effective. As it happens, these browsers often have good hardware acceleration for CSS transitions. So you can actually make that scrolling feel, feel pretty natural, but there's a bit of maths involved to do it yourself. So a lot of frameworks, uh, Central Touch again, a good example, uh, provide you with nice scrolling um, to, to make the user feel like, yeah, I know, I, I know I'm in an app because it's got nice scrolling. <clears throat> uh, touch events, obviously the whole advantage, or one of the big advantages of having a mobile device is that you've got these new ways that you can interact with the, the device, such as touching, swiping, pinching, and zooming, and dragging, and dropping. Sadly, mobile web browsers don't always expose these high-level gestures in a nice, consistent way for you, the app developer, to be able to use. Uh, you get sort of touch start and touch end, um, but things like swipes and, uh, and, and pans, uh, actually the browsers don't fire those events, sadly. Um, so frameworks uh, kind of have a requirement to, to try to understand the single events and turn them into these higher level gestures, um, you know, the five-fingered swipe or whatever. <coughs> uh, 
Uh, and then finally, uh, not so much the jQuery side of things, but on the, the, the center touch side of things, you, know, you need that ability to store your data models and kind of model your data structures on the client side and then be able to communicate back to a server, both to load that data in the first place and then to synchronize it subsequently. So um, you know, obviously you'll be looking for frameworks that have got support for JSONP, XML, YQL, and so forth. Um, if you kind of want to see some of this in action, uh, most frameworks have kind of like what you would call a kitchen sink app in a second, um, where you'll find that they have uh, thrown together all the functionality you can see in one place. Central Touch has one. Uh, go and check it out, central.com forward slash x forward slash 5e uh, on, on a WebKit based uh, browser or tablet or even on a desktop device, and you'll be able to see it in action. Yep? Sorry, is there? Well, the, yeah, the, the browsers will fire uh, the events like on a finger-by-finger -finger basis, but the devel app developer doesn't see it as a multi-touch event. Oh, yeah, they do. I mean, I think Android maybe didn't, but does now. I think iPhone always has, more or less. Um, but, yeah, you know, programmatically knowing that that happened is another matter. But they do support it, yeah. So uh, I think I've only got five minutes or so left. So we're getting on quite well here. We've looked at mobile. We've looked at webs. We've looked at how we can build apps with these new technologies and, and make them work across platform. Um, just want to kind of give you a sense of how you can put this all together and actually create something. Um, and I'm also appreciative of the fact that most people aren't building mobile apps in a vacuum. They're trying to integrate it with existing content or existing sites or services or apps. So, you know, the classic web stack looks something like this. You've got a server side where you've got your models and your controllers and your views, and all it's doing is spitting out HTML, CSS, and maybe a bit of JavaScript to make the buttons blink. Uh, and your browser just turns that into pixels. Everyone understands this. They have done for 15 years. The question is, how can we evolve this to take care of, of some of this new stuff that's happening? So, uh, well, one thing you can do, this is kind of a first step, and this is what's happened over the last few years, uh, is that people have had a separate mobile experience, but which is still being generated by the server. So whether it's m.yoursite.com or some other uh, separate domain, or whether it's using uh, browser detection, essentially you're emitting a different set of HTML, different set of CSS, different templates, in theory. Um, and a lot of content management systems, you know, WordPress, Drupal, and all those other guys, you know, you'll be able to find plugins that do this sort of thing, where there are different mobile themes and where the browsers will be detected one way or the other and the uh, different templates will be emitted. That's a good start. Um, but I think what I've been talking about today when we're talking about apps is, is something even further than that, where we're getting stuff out to the browser once, and then from then on, on the, on the device, on the, on the browser, we have a runtime, we have a, a, an app, which is, yes, communicating back to the server, but it's doing it over, over something like JSON, back to some RESTful API, and it's got its own copy of the data store, and it's running a little bit more autonomously from the server. Um, so this kind of classic web stack of request and response, where the user interface, business logic, and storage is on the server side, and the client just did rendering, is moving more to one where you've got you know, the user interface being generated by an app on the client. You've got business logic running on, on an app on the client. And you've even got local storage on the client. And now the question is more about synchronizing the two. It's not just about request response to a single uh, storage truth. Uh, it's about, you know, different apps out there which are providing an, an extremely reactive and responsive experience to the user, even when they're offline, <coughs> but which then obviously at some point needs to be synced back to the server. The challenge here is that synchronization is, uh, is a new problem for the web to have to solve. Um, sync is not, a, is not an unsolved problem in the computer science sense of the word, but for web people, it, it is a new set of skills to have to understand. You know, if someone updates a record of data whilst they're on their tablet on the plane and then they get off the plane and it resynchronizes with the server, you know, who's conflict? You know, how do you resolve the conflicts and whose changes win and all that kind of stuff? New things to think about. Uh, you might also say, well, you know, does this give us the opportunity to write once, run anywhere? Well, you know, I would say no. No one should be stupid enough to ever say that again. Um, but I would also say don't forget that the mobile medium is, is, is a different medium. The mobile web is not just a 320 pixel squeezed version of the regular web. Users want to do different things on different devices. They're going to be in different contexts 
They might be in different contexts. They probably have different intents. But also they have different user experience uh, expectations. So this is you know, the same app. It's a newsreader. Uh, on desktop, where you have like the left-hand tree view and the right-hand split-pane view. On tablet, when it's in landscape mode, you probably have a scrolly list on the left um, and nice big fonts to be able to click on. Uh, when it's in portrait, you expect that left-hand menu to kind of hang off the toolbar. You've probably seen that pattern. On the mobile device, you want it in one s sort of tall, thin list, <clears throat> where when you click on a detail record, it transitions to the left and you get the detail record of the post or what have you. So, you know, it, you, you, you can definitely use the same models and you can definitely use the same controllers and you can definitely use the same data storage, but ultimately the view layer is probably going to be different across different form factors. Unfortunately, that's just a fact of life. Um, I'm happy to be proved wrong here, but certainly users seem to have that expectation. Yeah, so the advantage is that you can use a lot of code, and so there is, a, there is an architecture that works here, I think, which is that you, when you've got this rich client app, you're just communicating with one consistent single server API, but then you're, you're storing the same stores, the same data, the same controllers, and you've just got a different view layer uh, for different types of devices. actually works quite nicely. The other final point I want to make is that, you know, if we were moving to a world where there's a thick client and a thin server, you know, it turns out there are things that you can't do in either place. Um, and that shortfall, I think, needs to get picked up by the, quote, cloud. Um, and here are some examples of the thought, sorts of things that aren't really suited to be done on a thinner server or on a thicker client. Um, and, and some of these we're already very familiar with, right? We're already very com comfortable with the idea of serving ads from the cloud or doing commerce or uh, analytics in the cloud. But things like image serving is, is, is a new one. Um, if you've got all these different devices with all these different screen sizes, you know, what sort of images should I send to them? I don't want to send the same five megapixel picture to every single device on the hope that it will rescale it on the client side. You know, it's kind of a stupid use of, of, of network bandwidth. You know, so are there ways in which we can use the cloud to resize our assets or adapt the assets that we need? Um, if we've got a very thin server or no server at all, you know, where else is it going to happen? So. We, we, we were exploring this idea ourselves. We recently launched a service called Censure IO. Um, and this is one example of, of a service that we offer. So if you've got a, a large image, mysite.com, myimage.png, uh, and you want to resize that for different mobile devices, we have uh, an API that allows you to basically prefix that URL with source.censure.io. And that is basically a proxy. It will request the image, but it will resize it for you before it gets sent to the device, uh, and it will resize it to the size that is appropriate for the device that requested it. So if you request that image with a tablet, it doesn't it resizes it to tablet dimensions. If you exactly the same URL requested with a mobile device, it'll size it down to that mobile device's screen size. So that's just an example of something that you, you have to think about if you're in a, a thicker client environment. You need to optimize the network resources, uh, and you don't necessarily have the server logic to do it yourself. A uh, couple of final points here. Uh, until very recently, people said, oh, the web will never compete with native apps because you can't go offline. Uh, wrong. You can. HTML5 specifies something called a app manifest, and this is a way for you as an app developer to describe your application and the assets that it needs in a, something called a cache manifest, where you basically list out all the files and resources. Your browser, if it supports this properly, will then aggressively fetch every single one of these assets and hoard them offline so that you can continue to access that web, that web service or web, sorry, website, web app uh, without having to be online. If any of you have ever used Google Mail on your, or Gmail rather on your iPhone and you've noticed that it works when you're on the plane, this is how they do it. <coughs> um, I have a small project myself on GitHub uh, which makes it really easy to generate that sort of file. It looks at your resources and it puts them all in the file for you. <clears throat> so going offline, if anyone tells you that's why you shouldn't do web, tell them it's bullshit. Yes? Uh, not streaming, but yeah, but there's a video object. Yeah, sure. Sure. It can be on different uh, domains as well. Uh, I think the only caveat is you, you can't mix HTTPS with HTTP content. That could be a bug. I don't know. <laughs> um, and, and there is obviously at some point a size limit here as well, which I think is probably around the five megabytes limit for most devices. Yep. 
That's for local storage of data. This is a separate cache for the application's own resources. So this is where you would put the HTML, the JavaScript, the CSS, any images that you needed. You see what I mean? The, 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 the store where you're using either uh, index DB or key value storage for your data. Yeah, so the spec just says we think it will be about five megabytes, and the browsers seem to have taken that literally. Um, hmm? Hmm, not that I know. I mean, it seems like an arbitrary limit to me. I agree with you. Um, but to be honest, I've never ruthlessly measured them empirically. Perhaps I should to find out what the actual limits are. Also, I don't know whether, you know, if you filled up one cache, whether that means the other one still has, I mean, is independent or not. I think in theory they are in practice. You never know with browsers. Um, but certainly, you know, I've never had a problem caching everything I need for a decent sized app, uh, at least in terms of its resources. Uh, I think I'm we're starting to run over at this point, so I'll go quickly. Um, the other point along similar lines is well, you know, my boss has told me we have to put it in the app store. And uh, huh, yeah, that's, that's a, a challenge. There are certain advantages to being to run your apps off a URL, of course. But then again, users seem to be quite well trained at finding stuff in app stores. So, you know, is there a way, is there a way that we can close the gap between the possibilities of the web and the distribution of a native app store? And there's a fantastic project called PhoneGap. It's not the only one, actually. There are plenty of others. So you could even make one yourself, I suppose. Basically, that wraps your web resources into a native wrapper so that you can then distribute that out through the Apple I, you know, um, iTunes app store or the Android marketplace. So basically, it's an embedded web browser inside a very thin app, and you package your HTML and your CSS and your JavaScript into that. It's basically a big zip file. Uh, and then when that executes on the browser, it just basically loads up those local files. So there's really nothing magic to it. Very, very simple. But it gives the user the impression that they're using a native app or they've downloaded a native app when, in fact, it's still the same HTML, JavaScript, CSS that you'd just written for the web. Yep. So in terms of getting icons on the iPhone, you've got two choices. The poor man's distribution is to just do add to home screen. And actually what happens is, on the iPhone anyway, when you add to home screen and then you relaunch it, if the app was configured in the right way, you lose the Chrome at the top and the bottom and you get a full screen view, which is kind of cool. This is, this is a step further. This you're actually compiling, packaging it up, and then distributing it. Um, a couple of things I should say about this. You're not compiling these. You're not compiling JavaScript into Objective-C or anything. It's literally just wrapping up this stuff. So you can, in fact, unzip other people's apps, and aha, I can see all their co code. I mean, people are used to being able to view source on the web, but uh, you would never rely on this packaging to sort of obfuscate it. If you're trying to build like a banking application, don't put all your secret keys in here because it's not protected. Um, <clears throat> But the other cool thing about PhoneGap in particular and, and a number of other of these packaging techniques is that they also provide you some extra JavaScript APIs that you can access, which in turn uh, connect to the native APIs of the device, which otherwise the browser wouldn't have let you get to. So for example, if you wanted to build a web app that had access to the camera or access to the contacts list, or access to the photo gallery or something on your mobile device. You can't get to that through the browser normally. But if you're running it in a phone gap wrapper, they've created some extra JavaScript APIs that let you punch in and out of that native thing. So that's kind of a cool thing. It won't work when you just run it on the web, but when it's in the phone gap environment, those extra APIs will be present. Um, I think pretty much my penultimate slide. I just thought I'd put this in because this is a common hurdle that people struggle with almost immediately. How do I debug this stuff? Debugging on a mobile device is a real pain. If you're used to being able to open up you know, uh, Firebug or uh, your WebKit inspector, it's, it's obviously there's no equivalent on a mobile device. But there's a cool tool called, uh, uh, well, actually, no one knows how it's pronounced. I think it's Winery, um, <clears throat> which is a remote debugger that allows you on your desktop to run basically a console that lets you bind to the browser on one of these, and you can do all the usual things that you're familiar with, you know, inspecting the DOM, uh, firing JavaScript, uh, uh, and so forth. Absolutely essential piece of tool, it's an essential piece of kit, uh, whether you're building traditional mobile web apps or even the ones that you're putting into to, to app stores. 
So I think that is pretty much it. We've had a look at all the elements of our uh, rather elaborate uh, JavaScript expression there. I just wanted to finish with one final thought, which is that you know, for years, uh, or it feels like years anyway, there's been this constant debate about whether it's you know, web versus apps, uh, native versus the web. Um, and to me, that's, it's the wrong question. It's not about apps versus web technology. You know, we now, with HTML5 and these other things that I've talked about, we have an opportunity to build apps with web technology. Uh, the two are not orthogonal anymore. And hopefully I've given you some insight or some ideas about what you can do with these cool things. And uh, what can I say? Go out and build amazing stuff. Thanks very much. I don't know if we have time for questions. But I'm around all day, so feel free. Yeah, we have one. Ah. Limited edition. Uh, actually, uh, if you go to, um, I can't remember the exact URL, but the W3C has a, a page for uh, all their kind of branded HTML5 stuff, and I think yeah, there's a link at the bottom to take you off to a store. And, uh, just Google it. <laughs>